in keeping with what Marissa has said, uh, that if your name is Michael, you certainly do belong on the stage. We are now completing our trifecta, or as we would say in the cricket community, our hat trick of Michaels. Um, our third Michael for this session, and our final Michael, is Prof. Michael Lungberg. Uh, Prof. Lungberg. Um, has quite an extensive list of achievements. He's a professor at the Department of Medical Radiation Physics, Lund University, Sweden. He started his research in the Monte Carlo field in 1983 by a project involving stimulation of whole body counters, but changed the focus to more general applications in nuclear medicine, imaging, and SPECT. Um, in 1994, Prof. Lundberg became an associate professor, and in 2005, a full professor. His current research also includes an extensive project in oncological nuclear medicine. Prof. Lundberg, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, to be clear, this image is not from Washington. It's our university building. In, in I have shown this a uh, couple of times before. Uh, I was quite in, inspired by the evening on Thursday, so I thought of starting with a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Suppose we have two electrons here, number one and number two. So the question is, what's the difference? You can think about that while I continue. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the symmetry and just to make a, some small refreshment about what the symmetry is, we have two types of the symmetries what we are working on. Uh, one for the diagnostic uh, application where the focus is more long-term effect because of the low dose. Uh, we use, usually use gamma or photons. We are not interested really in the individual, but rather a population, because it's a risk es estimate of a large population. And these risks are based on, on material, for example, for, for, from the, the atomic bomb in Japan. It's specific for the study, but it is not specific for, for the individual patient. And then we have dosimetry that we have been talking about today uh, with, for therapy. And there we are actually aiming to treat. So there they, we use high activities, we use high charged particles, and we are, have an individual focus. So it's a, it's a one person that we are focused on doing the symmetry. So this is system specific and it's patient specific. And of course, you know, uh, most of you, of course, uh, there is a lot of different types of studies and there is a lot of different radionuclides and we have been talking about several of them. I will not mention in detail, but here's a list. And they get beta and uh, different types of, of radiation. And the idea is that you inject or you administer by in, in injection or orally or, you know, or into the body, and then those traces and those radionuclides search uh, the target, so to speak, to deliver those. So you have some kind of, of first injection of the source that you are, you are, you are, are then hoping to, to, to treat the patient. The basic uh, uh, unit or what say the, the metric that we are using are the absorbed dose, which is uh, simply the deposit energy in a volume of mass. Uh, and and uh, that is uh, the, the basic for, for what we are, we are working on. In, in principle, it's uh, it defined as a point, but we usually average of, uh, on, of over a larger volume, such as an organ or something like that. So the main task in the symmetry is to see and calculate or estimate the radiation transport between the source and the target. And the target can be the same volume as the source, or it can be in, in uh, some, some place, uh, some distance away. 
So that is the, the symmetry part of, of, uh, of this work. And then we do this for different types of radio, uh, different types of particles. Usually, you have, you have a decay on several with several particles. So you add up uh, the, the contribution to uh, from one organ, one volume to all the other organs in, in the. So that is basic of, of the symmetry. And we, but it's good to have that clear in mind. I would also talk a little bit about external radiation therapy versus radionuclide therapy. Because we have, we have also a modality that irradiates and, and treat people uh, with, with tumors by external source. So if we look at a little bit about the difference here, so if we look at external therapy, it's a really a very well-defined source, and you can model and control the intensity and shape of the source. You can turn it off, you can turn it on, and the energy that is coming out or is deposited in, in the body is very uniformly distributed because it doesn't rely on an active uptake. It comes outside. And you get it in a high dose rate, so you can have a short, very high intense uh, exposure. If we come to the radiotherapy, you first have to inject the source into the patient. So now we come to the first problem, where does it go? We don't really know, so we need to measure it in some way. We can't turn it off, we can't turn it on. It's a radioactivity decay that can last for quite a long time. We have our imaging systems, but they are not really good. Uh, they are okay, but they are not good in terms of measuring spatial information. So we don't really see actually exactly the distribution. And often we use cameras that really is not optimized for these radionuclides. They are often optimized for diagnostic uh, imaging with technetium and so on. So we are probably not the best, we could have better cameras for this type of radionuclides. And then there is a redistribution, so we have to measure not only one image, but in principle several images to see how does this distribute, how does it go out from the, in order. Because the point is here that you want to calculate the total emitted energy. So, so and, and if those sources move around, you have to be uh, uh, control of, of what is going on. Also, it's a low dose rate, so extended of, uh, over time. The problem with the imaging is that it's, not, as I said, not the best. Uh, so this is a, a simulation I have done just to show a little bit what we problems to the le to the left here. Let's see here, to the left, we have a perfect we have a perfect patient here regarding imaging. A dead one doesn't move, so we have a quite a sharp uh, image. Uh, this is how it looks like. Sorry, this is an image how it looks like. This is what we want the image A. But if we add, if we add uh, the motion, the respiratory motion, you see the image B is a little bit blurred. And if we have a collimator, it will be in even more blurred. Figure D shows that you have attenuation and scatter effects and noise. So basically where we are is at image F, but we want to assume that that corresponds to the distribution it is in A. So we would have to correct as much as possible for all these physical effects uh, that we have in, in, in a real camera. Dosimetry evolved from, uh, I, I think, from planar imaging and for diagnostic dosimetry where you had, uh, could measure the activity but then connected the activity to a model of the patient. And that works fine, I think, for diagnostic risk estimates because you are not focused on that particular person. Uh, you also need to do several time points and then you can figure out the total energy and, and work out the, the doses. 
For patient-specific dosimetry, I don't think that this works very well because obviously we don't look like this phantom. Uh, we have different body sizes. So 3D dosimetry with SPECT, you can do it actually with, with PET also, although there is quite a few, few uh, long-lived uh, radionuclides. Uh, that needs uh, a certain procedure. Uh, and this shows the procedures. You need a functional image, you need an anatomical image, you need some kind of registration because you need both information in order to calculate the absorbed dose. You do need some kind of image reconstruction and you have to correct for all these physical events uh, uh, that can happen, scatter, attenuation and so on. And then you can go the dosimetry part, which is going from activity to, to, to absorb dose. And 3D is better because you have the depth information which you don't have in planar imaging. Luckily now, we have, most of us have per, uh, aspect CT, which makes the registration easy. So we have both uh, anatomical and uh, physical the, the uh, physiological, physiologic uh, image in the same machine. And also, nowadays, it's, uh, it's uh, quite standard reconstruction, attenuation correction. When I started, we had, I think that we have 10 reconstruction methods, 20 attenuation corrections, 30 scatter, and so on. But now it boils down to quite a standardized type of correction, iterative reconstruction and so on, and uh, to get this uh, uh, absorbed, uh, uh, to, to get the, these uh, uh, activity images. Just short, if you don't know what a reconstruction is, is based on trying to estimate the activity based on the projections. So you start with the first image and then you calculate projections and then you bring in your measured projections and compare those to your calculated measure, which is based, based on a model of the camera. You calculate the ratio and then you calculate the error project projection. And then you update the first estimate and then you do it again and again and again and again. And suddenly you get an image that is uh, this uh, uh, you're, you're happy with. And the key pin point here is that here in the, your model is all corrections collected in your forward projector. You can, by modeling scatter, attenuation, collimator resolution, and so on, you actually correct for it. So, so that is a very consistent method now that is available on on, on uh, uh, most systems. I must say something about the SPECT image here. Uh, this is two cats. We had those for a couple of years, uh, Hugo and Emil. And these are very sharp, nice, uh, nice sharp image of the cat I took with my, my phone. So this is how they look. Suppose we were to take a photo of these two cats with a pet camera. Meaning, let's take a photo with the resolution of the pet camera. And that will look like this. And if we take it with a SPECT camera, that will look like this. And if we put a medium energy collimator on, it would look like this. So what you see is not the truth. And that is a hard fact of all our images. It's not, what, it doesn't, it's not what we see that is correct, because we have a blurred image caused by, by the spatial resolution. So we need to have that always in, in your, your, your mind, that, that there is a, a blurring effect. And when you come to absorb dose calculation, you want to calculate energy over a volume with a certain mass. But the problem is with the SPECT camera is, is that when, uh, when you go down in volume, there is one, one stage where you cannot resolve more uh, small volumes. And that is when you're, you're reaching the spatial resolution. So even if you have very small 
volumes here, you get the image from the image, the same volume. And that when you reach the system spatial resolution. So you can't calculate smaller volume that, than your ca camera allow. And that makes some effects, we call it partial volume effect, counts are spread out on a larger area compared to, to what it actually is in, in the body. So we have to come correct for that for something with some method and often you use so-called recovery coefficients, which is some kind of coefficient that is trying to, to, to correct for the spill out of that. And, and uh, to get to the dosimetry, uh, you have to also to calibrate the camera and so on. So, so, and, and here is where you have your, your correction for this. So, how do we go from activity to absorb dose? Well, now you have an activity image and you have a density image or from, coming from CT. So you can do your your calculation of the energy transport actually within this patient's geometry using the patient's distribution of activity. <clears throat> and that is basically the same technique as you're doing for the diagnostic radio uh, dosimetry. You have this equation that you, you're, you're trying to, to calculate the transport. And you can then go, uh, get an uh, absorbed dose image by using some methods of obtaining the, the deposit energy from the activity. And it's very popular to, to then display this as, as uh, like these uh, graphs, integral dose volume histogram and differential dose volume histogram. But you should be very careful about this because the problem is that this represent and shows the distribution of voxel values. And a voxel value is always less than the spatial resolution. So a voxel value itself doesn't have any meaning because it's beyond, it's a smaller volume that, than the system resolution. Okay. That was a little background. So example of one study, we have been working a lot with lutetium. Uh, we have been uh, in, and I think that most of you know uh, this treatment. Uh, it, it's a treatment of neighbor endocrine tumors and, and we use a peptide uh, labeled to the, the lutetium-177 uh, named uh, called dotatate. And uh, uh, we use this uh, uh, radionuclide, which has quite a good properties for uh, using in, in therapy. It has an electron, but it also has two photons. And in fact, it's, uh, it's quite good that these photons are not high in abundance, because usually we give high activities, so we don't saturate the cameras. Uh, the peaks has an abundance, the two major peaks has an abundance of 10% and 6, which is quite small, but it's very good, because then you get a good imaging uh, properties. So th that is a good image, uh, the radionuclide. It, it emits two, two uh, peaks and we usually, we have been using only the higher peak because the corrections are a little bit more easier and the fact also that we have quite a large activity, we can afford not to use both peaks because we still have relatively good counting uh, uh, characteristics. So this study was designed to give fixed treatments and then, then monitor the dosimetry at each treatment until a certain level. Uh, we use the BED of 27, and if it was possible, some of the patients could go up to 41. So we did this course, and we did dosimetry on all these, uh, these uh, 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 treatments. We did four bone scan and we did one spect uh, at 24 hours 
And uh, we used the bone, bone scan images to get the shape of the curve. And then we used the spect to adjust because we know that usually planar dosimetry overestimated dosimetry. So, so we, we had one uh, spect at the same time as the second bone scan, and not bone scan, whole body scan. And then we adjusted the curve down here. So that was our procedure for, for, for dosimetry. And then calculated the BED because this is a long time uh, treatment, uh, long time with the radiation. So you get some kind of, of reparation and so on. So, so this is published and I just wanted to show the results. And I will not go into the details, but this shows that a fixed amount actually is not, for the most of patients, a fixed number of treatment wasn't enough. Some patients had up to eight before reaching the, 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 the level. Some patients had only three before reaching the level. So this clearly shows that there is a variation in the, the patient, which means that a dosimetry is needed to get optimal results. So there's just a summary of, uh, of, of the results. Uh, and we had a good number of data, so we did some kind of uh, elaboration. What time point should we use in order to reduce and simplify the method? And it turns out that the kinetics was quite good, or what is it, uh, very similar. So it actually was possible to, to have one uh, uh, good result for only one. Measurement at 96 uh, hours, and this was published in a paper in Journal Nuclear Medicine, and actually it was selected to be the best article 2019. So, if you're interested, you can Google that up. Uh, I'm not an expert in alpha, but alpha is coming, and alpha, we have talked about alpha before here, and and it's it's a particle that that uh, work has a very high LET, so, but the problem, because it gives a lot of, of large uh, absorbed dose per unit activity, the imaging is quite poor. So, uh, so uh, there is a challenge in trying to do good imaging. We are working a little bit in Lund, doing some kind of reconstruction with, with this type of, of uh, but that is a challenge, also because of the chain of decay. Uh, a little bit behind, but I, I just want to mention also that even if we do good things on voxel, we don't know what's it, how it looks like within a voxel. So it turns out that, that, that the, if we look at, let's say, a macroscopic image like this, and look at the testes, it, sound, it looks very uniform. But this, uh, if you look down in detail here, and this is a, not a human testis but a rat, you see that the uptake of it is very heterogeneous distributed. If you go even down below, in, you can see that you have some, oh, sorry, some hot spots here. Uh, so the activity and the dose are really very heterogeneous, and that is because this is a target uh, thing. Uh, and even down to the nucleus, you can see that there is very local absorption here. And generally, I think that all organs that we, we are imaging and, and treat are not taking up this uniformly, even if it looks like the, on the, yeah. So, I will skip this here and go to the, to the quiz. So we had two electrons. The one electron comes from a decay in, radio, in radionuclear therapy. The other one comes from a Compton interaction caused by the ex external beam irradiating the body. This electron doesn't need any dosimetry. It's enough that you use fixed activity regardless of patient. You don't even need an imaging to, to figure out how, how this will affect and so on. This electron needs dosimetry. 
There is very careful treatment planning system available. You, you are looking at using CT or you can verification. But it's the same particle. It does the same, same damage. So why the difference? So why don't we use this, do the same dosimetry in radionuclear therapy as in external? Because we are using exactly the same type of particles for at least for, for, for the beta. I published this 35 years ago, and I'm still st standing here to talk about this. 1988, I will, I will soon stop. But we have the technology now that we can do it. Uh, we also have very consistent and, and, and uh, reconstruct and quantification which is available on most cameras in, and works almost about the same. And the dosimetry is not, not a, any problem to do, so why don't we do it now? Uh, because we have the tools and we can do a voxel base and that is fine. And we can wait and we can hope that these new systems that can allow, you, allow us to do a better. Uh, but we must realize that, that this, with, this is a teamwork that maybe not always, I mean the radionuclear therapy is a teamwork between medical, radiation, medical doctors, medical physicists and technologists that maybe not fits in to the logistics of certain departments because this is a different way of work. But I think that everything is here now more or less, so we should start doing and treating electrons from radionuclear therapy equal to electrons from radiotherapy. Uh, yep, I will skip the last one. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof. Lundberg, for a very engaging and a very absorbing talk. <laughs> and um, uh, it's very relevant, as Prof. Sidi has mentioned, uh, everything is a potential poison. It just depends on the dose. So it's very important to us. This is just a small token of appreciation. <laughs>